I just want to go through a few quick house rules and then we will invite Dr. Abbott to come and give you the official welcome. Um, first, I wanted to let you know thank you that we're very thankful for you all coming and you all taking your time. We know that a few of you need to step out. Um, we will have a break at 11 a.m. If you can um, refer to the schedule break here, I'll go through this really quick. Um, the bathrooms, right outside the door to the right, the bathrooms. Um, you can see we'll have two breaks that are scheduled. We'll try to stick really, really, really closely to this problem. I mean, we're starting a little bit late, but we're having two minute breaks, so she is the fact um, after two minutes. So we will start with Byron Wilson, who has a video testimony. She's um, going to be sharing her words from Washington, D.C., from the Public Policy Institute. Um, we have Ms. Seth Mitchell, who's a little bit this morning. Then we'll move on to Keith and Franklin. Um, and then we'll be talking to the really nice people who have a lot of names that we're going to try to get her in before that time. 
We'll have a quick break. We're going to talk to Dr. Sipsi-Mojo. Um, at 11.45 in the morning, we will have um, Dr. Lisa Gray um, giving his testimony. We will have a quick lunch break. Um, lunch will be in the guest lounge, and so we'll be welcome to go out and eat and grab food. Um, and Gail Tyree will join us at 1.30 to give her testimony. At 2 o'clock in the we will have Reverend Dr. Horace Harris with us. And we'll be testimony and education this evening.
that you commissioners, uh, all of you, uh, found it important to set aside time to join us in this history-making moment. And um, I am personally uh, just blessed by your presence. Um, well, we all are blessed, but I am personally uh, also and would um, just encourage you to find one of our team members. If you have a question or raise your hand, we will come to you and assist you with anything that you need during throughout today. Um, I'd like to just make a couple of announcements. Um, at the last moment, in fact, when we were on the runway on our way to Memphis yesterday, Dr. Carruthers uh, received a call from the court reporter, the stenographer, um, who was to, um, that she had engaged to do the hearing today, to do the transcribing. And so we were uh, surprised, um, but also thankful that we were notified in time. She had an accident on her way to Memphis and was, and was unable to be with us. And so we had a moment to then begin making calls and we worked for hours yesterday um, looking for a replacement, and we're indeed grateful to uh, Reverend Dr. Gina Stewart for helping us to make those connections at the very latest hour <laughs> yesterday. Um, so we welcome Luann Dudley, who is the president and CEO of Mid-South Reporting, and she will be doing the um, transcribing for us today. In your folder, Commissioners, in your folders, um, you have on the left-hand side of your folder a couple of um, media consent and release forms. I would ask you to please take a moment right now um, in, within the spirit of us transitioning into the day um, to sign those forms and I will collect them. And you may keep one for yourselves. It should be on the left-hand side of your folder. Thank you very much. Tiana.
Okay, thank you. So once again, after um, Dr. Mosley collects the media release forms, we will start with our first testimony from Ms. Valerie Wilson from the Economic Policy Institute. So we just ask that you turn your attention to the back screen. We ask that the audience um, shift around quite a little bit. Um, her video should be about 10 minutes long. We know that it's 9.17 now. That means we have three minutes for reflection before moving on to the next testifier. So we ask that we will please stick to that schedule. You know we're a little bit late, but let's try to be on time if we can. Um, so Ms. Valerie Wilson. Leaders and members of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, I regret that I am not able to be there in person, but I thank you for inviting me to testify for your truth-telling commission on economic justice. My name is Dr. Valerie Wilson, and I am a labor economist and director of the Program on Race, Ethnicity, and the Economy at the Economic Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. EPI is a nonprofit, nonpartisan research institute committed to promoting the economic interests of low and middle income families in economic policy debates. We do this through our research and policy analysis and by proposing public policies that protect and improve economic conditions for these families. The Program on Race, Ethnicity, and the Economy helps to bolster this mission by establishing the facts about and drivers of racial and, and ethnic disparities in employment, earnings, household income, and wealth, as well as the role of race and institutional racism in shaping these differences. I would like to share some of these facts pertaining to the relative economic progress of African Americans nationwide since 1968, and then compare the current national picture with that of the state of Tennessee and the city of Memphis. My comments will be focused largely on labor market outcomes since the majority of Americans earn their income through employment. As we reflect on what life was like for African Americans in this country 50 years ago compared to now, one thing is clear. Despite decades of policies, programs, protests, and outstanding achievements by African American men and women in many aspects of American life, race far too often remains a deciding factor in the economic status of African Americans relative to whites. In 1968, less than half, or 42.4 percent, of African American adults were high school graduates compared to nearly two-thirds 65.7% of whites. Fast forward 50 years, and the data indicate that great strides have been made toward raising educational attainment among African Americans and closing the education gap relative to whites. In 2016, 92.5% of African American adults were high school graduates, with 61.7% having gone on to attain some level of post-secondary education beyond high school. Among whites, 95% were high school graduates, and 70.3% have some level of post-secondary education. In the state of Tennessee in 2016, the relative education gap between blacks and whites was similar to the national average, although the absolute levels for both groups were lower than the national average. In 2016, 85% of African American adults in the state of Tennessee were high school graduates, compared to 88.5% of whites. 51.3% of African Americans in the state of Tennessee had attained some level of education beyond high school, compared to 55.7% of whites. In the city of Memphis, however, these gaps were notably larger. In 2016, 84.2% of African Americans were high school graduates compared to 95% of whites. 51.3% of African Americans in Memphis had attained some level of post-secondary education beyond high school compared to 74.2% of whites. 
The important thing to understand about the role of education is that it is undeniably important for economic mobility. At higher levels of education, African Americans have lower unemployment rates and higher earnings than they would otherwise. But education has not been enough to eliminate racial economic inequality. This is reflected in the persistent racial gaps in unemployment rates, median hourly wages, median household income, and poverty rates. Since the Bureau of Labor Statistics began reporting the black unemployment rate in 1972, it has almost always been about twice the white unemployment rate, both in good economic times and in bad, as well as at every level of education. Although the average black unemployment rate for 2017 was at an all-time low of 7.5%, that rate was still double the average white unemployment rate for the year, which was 3.8%. Comparing unemployment rates by education, we find that in 2017, African Americans with advanced degrees still had an unemployment rate that was higher than whites with a bachelor's degree only. And African Americans with a bachelor's degree had an unemployment rate that was closer to the unemployment rate of whites with only a high school diploma. In 2017, the black unemployment rate in the state of Tennessee was 6.1%. This was slightly lower than the national average, but still nearly double the white unemployment rate in the state, which was 3.3%. Nationally, in 2016, the median black worker earned 75% of what the median white worker earned in an hour. Although the wage gap between black and white workers narrowed during the latter part of the 1960s through the 1970s due to the passage of important civil rights legislation, it has gotten larger since 1979. This is true even among those with the same levels of education and experience and living in the same region of the country. In fact, the black-white wage gap has actually grown the most among college graduates. The expansion of the black-white wage gap can be attributed to three trends. One, limited wage growth among middle and low wage workers, a group where African Americans are overrepresented. Two, above average growth among the highest wage workers, a group where African Americans are underrepresented. And three, growing racial inequality in hiring, pay, and opportunities for promotion. In the state of Tennessee in 2016, the median black worker earned 81% of what the median white worker earned in an hour. These disparities in unemployment and wages are reflected in racial differences in household income. In 1968, the median non-white household, the majority of which were black, earned 63% of the income of the median white household in a year. In 2016, the median black household earned just 61% of median white household income. In the state of Tennessee, the median black household earns 69% of median white household income while in the city of Memphis, the median black household earns just 56% of the median white household. These disparities in income translate into higher rates of poverty for African Americans relative to whites. In 1968, with a poverty rate of 33.5%, African Americans were three times more likely to live in poverty than whites. In 2016, the black poverty rate at 22% was only slightly lower than it was almost 50 years ago, but still two and a half times higher than the white poverty rate. That same year, the poverty rate for African Americans in the state of Tennessee was 26.3%. This was more than double the state's white poverty rate of 12.5%. In the city of Memphis, nearly a third of African Americans 32.3% live in poverty, a rate which is nearly two and a half times 
the poverty rate of whites living in the city of Memphis. Addressing these problems requires truth about how we got here, a willingness to change, and a shift of power. I'd like to share just a few of the ways that policy can be used to shift the balance of power with regard to employment and pay. First, it's important that we consistently enforce anti-discrimination laws in hiring, promotion, and pay for women and workers of color. This, at a minimum, requires greater transparency in how these decisions are made and access to this information by workers uh, as a critical tool for enforcing and making their case and their claims for racial discrimination. We must also address the broader problem of stagnant wages by raising the federal minimum wage, creating new work scheduling standards, and rigorously enforcing laws aimed at preventing wage theft. We must also strengthen the ability of workers to bargain with their employers by combating state laws that restrict public employees' collective bargaining rights or the ability to collect fair share dues through payroll deductions. We must also push back against the proliferation of forced arbitration clauses that require workers to give up their right to sue in public court. Finally, we must require that the Federal Reserve pursue monetary policy that targets full employment with wage growth that matches productivity gains. While each of these policies are important for raising wages and, and improving employment outcomes for all workers, they will disproportionately impact marginalized workers, many of whom are African American. In closing, I'd like to mention that all of the data I've described thus far only refers to the non-institutionalized population. That means those in our nation's prisons and jails are not included in these estimates. The rise in mass incarceration since the 1980s is a trend that has disproportionately impacted African Americans, both in terms of rates of incarceration, its damaging effects for individuals, families, and communities, and our ability to accurately measure the economic status of the broader African American population. Therefore, criminal justice reform must also be a part of any movement for economic justice. Once again, I thank you for your time, and please uh, don't hesitate to contact me if you have other questions or would like more information regarding economic disparities by race and ethnicity. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Carruthers for arranging to have Valerie as uh, the lead witness. Um, Valerie was modest. She is uh, by far the preeminent uh, economist in documenting this data, and so that was a real treat for us. Unfortunately, we won't get a chance to ask her questions, but I hope that the commissioners will, in their response, uh, reflect on what uh, Dr. Wilson uh, reported. Education is important and African Americans benefit from education and lower unemployment rates and earnings. That was one of her key points. Then she added but, and actually this was a big but. Mm -hmm. But it does not address racial disparity because as she pointed out, at each educational level of attainment, there are racial disparities. And they are equal at each level of educational attainment. So you can have more black college graduates, but you won't close the racial gap because they have the same gap. And as she reported, the growing, the fastest growing gap in earnings. <laughs> So it's chasing an elusive target. So often we want to blame the schools, but what's clear from the data is schooling has nothing to do with it. Please remember in her testimony, if you are black and have a college degree, a college degree, that gets you an unemployment rate that looks like you are a white high school graduate. 
a white high school graduate. So as much as we want more education, and that's to improve the lives of individuals, that has nothing to do with the racial gaps. That's a different question. So um, commissioners, can, can we please get some uh, responses or some thoughts or some reflections on the wonderful testimony? I know uh, Dr. Wilson had so much data, um, uh, and I know there were different parts of it that some of you would like to respond to. Dr. Spriggs, I, I, just to make a couple of observations, and I agree completely with your assessment of what uh, Ms. Wilson had to say. For African Americans, there are some unique implications of education versus knowledge. Um, and, I, and I make the point that our, our paychecks and our benefits quite often are related to our lack of education as opposed to our abundance of knowledge. And, and I make that on the basis of that, let me use my father as an example, uh, who didn't graduate from any school, but, but he could tune up for, for Buick Roadmaster. Um, but his paycheck reflected his lack of education not his abundance of knowledge. And, and as we look at programs and policies to deal with this, we have to recognize that in our communities, I mean, we start with a handicap of substantial numbers of uh, individuals in certain wage, uh, rather age levels, that miss the opportunities for education. So they got an abundance of knowledge, but limited education. Uh, and as we look for and search for policies to deal with this, we got to recognize that that consideration has to be put into the mix so that living wages uh, become the goal uh, in many cases. Um, there's a tremendous uh, battle on now for low-wage workers to have an opportunity to earn a decent wage. And clearly, as Dr. Wilson pointed out, the ability to participate in a negotiating process where you arrive at a decision and determination about wages that reflects the demand. And so I think for those folks, we've got to advocate strongly for their right to participate in organized and collective action. Um, right now, we're confronted with the issue of the, the war against organized labor, uh, which is a battle to hold down wages and benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, and so many of us don't understand the nature of, of that fight. Uh, and you can see that, that the fight is moving itself upward into the higher levels of educated workers because the assault is to keep wages and benefits down mm -hmm. as opposed to give folks an opportunity to earn a decent living. If I can, um, I think the rest of the commission and the record would benefit if uh, you could lay out for us one of those big threats, the Supreme Court case called Janus, particularly because the last sticking point involved in the Memphis Sanitation Worker Strike, which we're commemorating today, and you're about to lay a wreath for uh, the horrible incident that birthed that strike, the sticking point was over uh, dues deduction. And how would the union dues be paid and the city uh, drug its feet over figuring out an answer to that? That was vital to the survival of that union as, as it launched. And so I think it would be helpful for us if you could help us reflect both on the strike that we're commemorating which was for a set of low-wage workers to demand and win decent pay, but also the threat that this Supreme Court case has. Let me spend a minute on the first one. The, um, the, the decision that these men made was that they absolutely needed a vehicle to represent their interests before the city and, 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 and uh, in the relationship to their wages and their benefits. So they, they were convinced that they needed a union. 
But beyond that, they recognize that they could have a union, but if it couldn't have the finances to do the work it had to do, uh, they were in no better shape. So their, their argument was that they wanted to have a union, they wanted to have their dues checked off so it would be available for the organization to do its work. Uh, and, and, and the city fathers recognized that that was the, was the key. Uh, they could give them a union, but if it wasn't able to function, uh, nothing would change. Uh, and as we look at that in today's life, the, the case that's before the Supreme Court now, which is called the Janus case, comes out of the state of Illinois, uh, the intent there is to prevent the union from having a voice to act collectively on the interests of the workforce as a whole. Uh, it, uh, it is organized to prevent uh, what we call checkoff in, in the system. Uh, and therefore, if you kill checkoff, uh, you kill the union's ability to function. Uh, and uh, the issue broadly, not just in Illinois, is particularly in the public sector, which Janice relates to, you have substantial employment for African Americans over time. Uh, we used to have a saying that you find more PhDs per square foot in the post office than you would anywhere else. Uh, and the issue here is that they have gained over time the ability to collectively represent themselves and therefore you find in many areas wages competitive uh, in, in, in totality. So the Supreme Court, uh, and we believe we're in some real difficulty, uh, seeks to uh, sustain the, Van the Janus suit in spite of the fact that it was turned down at the lower level. The ultimate end result would be a diminution of the ability of unions to represent the interests of public sector workers. And you would have a, a further impact on communities of color and particularly the, the African American community because substantial numbers of our workers are represented in the public sector. Thank you, and, and I apologize to my fellow commissioners, but it's such a unique opportunity that we had. Uh, and, and just to emphasize uh, the importance of Bill Lucy to that whole strike. Absolutely. When the Department of Labor uh, inducted the Memphis Sanitation Workers into the Labor Hall of Fame, the U.S. Department of Labor inducted them into the Labor Hall of Fame, the, the, the U.S. Labor Hall of Fame. Yes. Uh, when we had the ceremony to do that and recognize that that ceremony took place uh, 45 years after the strike, so these men, some of them had canes, uh, when they were on stage and they saw Mr. Lucy walk into the auditorium, you would have thought they were 30 again. They jumped up without the cane and went running to hug him uh, in recognition. Uh, it, it was a beautiful thing. Um, do we have reflections from other commissioners? You know, there is in our community a kind of general idea that in our culture, we make progress. And in regards to African American communities, high visibility leadership roles for a few would lead most of us to think, gee, look how far we've come in 50 years. But the data from Dr. Wilson suggests that all of these high profile representatives of folks who have made it must not delude us to thinking that the statistics for us all are that much different now. So the impact of her statement is, don't be deluded by a few that made it through. Look at the aggregate data, and we have not come that far. That's a very important thing for us to get into our minds. Yes. Um, you know, there was a, uh, not really a cartoon on Facebook that showed the race. And there are two people racing. One was an African American, one was white. The road for the white person was smooth like glass. The road for the African American had all kind of obstacles in its way. And I think that's what we find when we look for employment, when we look for educational opportunities, Today, more than ever, 
I think after we have made progress and there are people who look at us and say, I think they've gone too far now. Let's see what we can do to impede their progress. I think that's the problem we're having right now. Mm -hmm. um, if I could say, okay, can we just go down this way? Uh, I'm sorry because, you know, and then we'll get. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I really appreciated what Dr. Wilson had to say, and of course, it's just very painful to know that we are where we are, <laughs> given what was discussed. But one of the pieces, and I know she didn't have time to go deep within it, is the uh, reality of more single female headed households and particularly the further disparities with women uh, because of that and other issues that uh, feed into the male-female disparity piece as well. And I just want to lift that up and also to lift up the piece around unemployed youth uh, and the challenges therein, of not adequate educational opportunities, adequate job opportunities, and all the rest that goes with the racist systems that we know that we have. So just want to lift that up as some other points of concern relative to the data that was shared, um, given the limited time. Thank you. I too would uh, echo the sentiments of the fellow commissioners, and I would just simply say I think what she pointed out that cannot be taken for granted or underestimated is the intentionality around policy to specify which particular segment of our communities need the help the most, because I think we live under the myth that the rising tide floats all boats. And I think the data that she's pointed out has just uh, rebutted that entire theory. So I understand that many people who are engaged in policy work uh, specify these pitfalls and these stop gaps as to why we cannot um, specify a particular demographic when we are constructing policy. But I do think we are experiencing the reality that there has been a particular segment of our population been supported in policy throughout and I think our responses and our current policies our newer policies have to be equally as specific um, I, I apologize to the other commissioners who, who wanted to uh, reflect on dr. Wilson's um, testimony uh, we're running a little behind and so and we, with we to respect our um, next uh, witness who is uh, already supposed to have spoken and started <laughs> to speak. Um, please, please indulge us to, to, get, our, to get back in time. My name is Tawan Stout Mitchell. I am a baby boomer who lived through the civil rights era. I'm a Christian believer. I'm a member of Christ Missionary Baptist Church, Pastor I'm Dr. Dr. Gene Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> I am a philanthropist who give all I have. I am a social worker administrator, a retired executive director for American Cancer Society for three states. I am a retired public official and elected four times in this great city of Memphis. I've been appointed by four mayors as director of community relations, administrative, uh, administrator for government affairs. I'm a wife, mother, grandmother, caregiver, HBCU graduate, <laughs> and a postgraduate degree in education. I'm a Democrat and sometimes an independent. <laughs> I'm a supporter of women, gender equality, uh, commentary. I am a commentator for two local television stations, a blog, and throughout my life, I have remained a public advocate. Mm -hmm. I am retired, but not tired. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Having worked in the field of social work for most of my life, I have learned that most people want a good job to support their families, provide health care for their children. A desire, they desire an opportunity for advancement, training, tuition reimbursement programs. They want their homeowners, they want to be homeowners. They would eagerly, eagerly support quality public schools capable of offering their children an opportunity to take their children to the next step up the ladder. 
But we are offering them just the opposite. When we offer them low wage, pick them, pull them, pack them jobs with 30 hour work weeks and no benefits. <coughs> this forces them to take two jobs just to live above the poverty line and still no benefits. Thus robbing them of a quality time to spend with their families and as a public advocate, it's alarming that our tax dollars support this strategy. A strategy which is not only unjust, but hastens the deterioration of families and the creation of a working class poor. I recently read an article produced by Smart City Consulting, and its purpose is to connect dots and provide perspectives on events, issues, and policies that shape Memphis. Smart City. Smart City Memphis was named one of the most intriguing blogs in the U.S. by the Pew Partnership for Civic Change. I want to read that article into this record. Our advantage is the Negro. There is no race problem at all. This comment was made in the 1900s in the commercial appeal. And they were assessing the new century economy back in Memphis. A Memphis business men's club, an all white group that would become the Chamber of Commerce. Boasted about how low wage paid to African Americans was a competitive advantage for our city. This club even managed to update the mean by having a happy slave for the drawing of the 21st, 20th century, for the dawning of the 20th century. While no one be, would be mindless enough to say that it was that way today, it's still no less true that a Memphis economy that is still based on low wage, low skill jobs draws a line in the century old attitudes to more economic policies that can <coughs> exploit African American labor. Fast forward from the turn of the century to the late to late 1970s. At that time, a governor by the name of Tennessee Governor was Lamar Alexander issued his first executive order. And that first executive order was to convene a Memphis Jobs Conference. I remember that. Was excited about it. And we all gathered proud of a milestone that we could convene and talk about and direct our future job plans and growth for this city. The job conference brought together a broad base of cross section of Memphians in 1979 to acknowledge the crisis and agree on an agenda. By 1981, the job conference brought a national motivational speaker who urged Memphis to take risks and to think bigger and aim higher. And yet, the new economic agenda produced the meetings reflected and the powers to be of Memphis decided what we needed most was jobs in the area of tourism, warehouse distribution, and uh, pick them, pull them, pack them jobs. About six years later, peak wages were built into the thinking of what is called a power, payment of lieu, in lieu of taxes. Mm -hmm. And we as a city began to give tax breaks to corporations for <coughs> low wage jobs. And we promoted our city that we have cheap labor and low wage jobs. For years, the tax holidays were given to companies that paid so little in, little in salaries that many employees qualified for food stamps or public health care. It's marginal, marginally better today, but tax breaks are still given to companies that do not pay a living wage. 
it's a strange paradox. While local government does not have enough money to invest that improve job opportunities, education, job training, public transportation, minority businesses, to name a few, just a few. We have enough money to waive $750 million every 10 years in subsidies for big corporations. Mm -hmm. As a result of the cost of public services for these companies, we shift the burden of running the government on the backs of small business owners mm -hmm. and homeowners, That's so That's right. particularly low-income taxpayers right. who pay twice. That's right. As much of their earnings in the high-tax income tax payers, this is really just a re another form of a regressive tax. And Tennessee has one of the worst in the United States. These generous corporate sus subsidies and incentives have not improved the lives of significant numbers of African Americans. Because while Memphis has, rep has, a, uh, has, has a large population and a lot of jobs, many of those jobs are low wage jobs. From 1990 to 2012, a number of low-wage jobs in Memphis region increased by 40%. Middle-income jobs rose by 10%. And high-income jobs went up 19%. When the 1979 Jobs Conference was held, the average income for whites in Memphis was twice that of African Americans. And, and nagging disparities remain today. The Memphis Metro economy is the 47th largest in the United States at more than $70 billion. In other words, a per capita slice of GDP is about $50,000. However, 20% of the Memphians subsist today on less than $13,000 a year. Mm. And the average per capita in income in Memphis is just over $22,000. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Memphis has dropped in the ranking of the 50, of the largest 50 regions in the critical economic indicators like educational attainment, income growth, poverty rate, and uh, percent of income spent on transportation and medium wage for workers of color who earn less than $7 an hour mm -hmm. than their white folks. Mm -hmm. Today, Memphis is kind of the regional economy, economy would be by about 22.2 billion larger if there was no disparity between the workers as a result of their race. Closing the gap in the region is the single largest economic opportunity for Memphis, but it is never mentioned. It's a startling oversight, considered that by 2040, 66% of the region's population will be of color largely African American. Strictly speaking, breaking the link between race and equality, inequality is a matter of self-preservation. We should adopt an economic justice as a core principle in this. It's long. At its essence, it's all about economic justice. For more than a century, the absence of economic justice has really been a drag on that economy and has caused significant numbers of Memphians an opportunity to move to the middle class and above. The absence of economic justice also creates a culture that grounds down too many Memphians until they are really, they lose hope about their own futures. And that leads them <coughs> to conclude that their city does not really care about them. Here's the, one, here's the thing. Memphis is number one among 50 largest metros in the number of nonprofits per 10,000 population. And 60% of them working with low income people. Today, there is an array of programs, projects, almost on every subject, dealing with every age group, and a growing number of anti poverty initiatives. 
and focus on all parts of their lives. But the one part they really need, so they will not need a program. That's right. That's it. A big way. That's it. What's missing is the thread holding all of these programs together. Economic justice. And it will and the will to create it by government, the nonprofit, and the business leadership. They have to be united to change this. It is by adopting and living economic justice as a core principle that we can create a better opportunity for every person to live a productive life with dignity and self-determination. In this way, the power of economic justice is not that it is aimed at individuals who deserve better choices and opportunities as, as important. It is aimed at also as aimed at our, ourselves as a people because we have, we have to design our institutions and our economy to eliminate discrimination, racism, privilege, inequality, and a culture that often assigns children's future at birth. It's a tall order for Memphis. And we know that we are making progress with policies like $15 minimum wage so that work and poverty cannot be used in the same way. When we focus on minority entrepreneurship, because African Americans are three times more likely to create their own businesses than whites. When we develop pre K programs and we focus on reforming our criminal justice system. And as you said, when we focus on building better lives for strong mothers. It is often said that Memphis does not have a vision. While there is much that we can and should do to com commemorate the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's murder in 2018, the greatest monument of all would be for Memphis to set an economic justice vision, purpose, and aspiration, and relentlessly pursue it to deal once and for all with structural problems that Dr. King described, socialism for the rich and rugged individualism for the poor. There is no question that economic justice has become a central part of Dr. King's message. The struggle for genuine equality means economic equality. He talked about the other America that transformed bullions and hope into fatigue and despair. And he knew that we cannot address race while ignoring inequality. And that it is not meaning that justice is not meaningful without job and a level playing field. His words are as true today as they were then. Economic justice in this test of our times, and there's no there's no, there's no, there's no one more than Dr. King who should inspire us to pass this on. In my summary, I have been so disappointed in the decisions that have been made in Memphis. Sure, pilots are necessary to attract businesses and for big corporations to grow. I understand that. But our pilots have been placed in place for decades and we've had no independent review of them since inception. Pilots, payment in lieu of taxes, should give employment preferences to Memphis and Shelby County rep residents who are burdening the cost of the pilot rather than Mississippi and Arkansas. Pilots should require a living wage. Yeah with benefits, no, no living wage, no pilot. Is it too much to ask for pilots to give second chances for nonviolent felons to help them make positive steps toward changes in their lives by giving them their first great job? Should we require contractual agreements 
that pilots must limit temporary workers only for overflow of work. So people won't be stuck in temporary jobs. Should we demand that an independent review of pilots be made every five years? Is it too much to ask for pilots to set a standard of hiring practices that limit part-time workers? Why would we have some benefit of pilots that would work against city employees receiving health benefits in their old age? In this city, retired public servants lost their health benefits mm -hmm. unless they could pay it at 100% of the cost. 100% of the cost on an average retirement check of $28,000 is about, for a single person, $600 to $800 a month. Mm -hmm. For a married person with a spouse, well, for, mm -hmm. with a spouse, about $1,200 to $1,500 a month of that $28,000 is living. Mm -hmm. We did that. We did it. No justice. No, no peace. peace. No. Sister Juan is my member, and I am familiar with her history of public service. Let me thank you and also thank Dr. Carruthers for inviting you and extending this invitation. And thank you for such a cogent and comprehensive overview of the structural inequality that is in Memphis. Dr. Forbes and I leaned over to each other and said, it is ironic that 50 years after the death of King, we're still fighting basically, essentially, the same battle that we fought 50 years ago. I'm certain that there are, uh, since there are several Memphians on this panel uh, who are acting as commissioners, that your comments have opened up the possibility and a setting for very lively dialogue and discussion, particularly the is issue of pilots where a city works against the best interest of its citizens by giving companies tax incentives to pay low wages. So I defer and uh, open the floor or open this time for our commissioners to share at this time. Oh, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Juan. How are you today? I'm fine, Ms. Tim. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you. Um, I appreciated your entire testimony. Thank you. Um, and you said a key word for me, and that was transportation. And when you illustrated the impact of working two jobs on family and children, that really drives home why we need to do even more of digging into the true story of this work. So my question is, you know, a study came out a few months ago that said it's, there's an hour wait at a minimum uh, in one direction to ride the Memphis Area Transit Association's bus system. Um, and knowing that the impact this has on low wage earners and thus trickling down to family and kids impacting education and jobs. Can you share with us a bit about what you've observed the city doing to uh, make changes to build a more robust transportation system that can have people spend more time at home? I'd be, a, I'd be very uh, candid with you. We're doing very little because the bus system, public transportation really needs a designated tax designated source of income. Mm -hmm. If you really want it to grow uh, hand to mouth, what are we going to get from the council this year? And the council will have 20 or 40 other priorities and they're not riding bus. So to me, it needs a dedicated uh, source of income. And once you do that, they can determine by the flow of money that comes into them how they expand their services. But they, if you will look at the records, our public transportation system uh, really is cut mostly every year, not getting more. Thank you. Good morning, and it's Good morning. always a gift to be in your presence. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, as uh, my other commissioners have already shared, our co-chair has shared a very impeccable presentation. Uh, I want to ask you about something that I don't think anybody can speak to as eloquently and as 
pertinently as you can with regards to black leadership on that. And I'm saying this, uh, <laughs> well, I want to preface the statement so I can be clear in terms of my intent. Reflecting on um, Dr. Forbes' statement about basically what King would call black tokenism. Mm -hmm. And then thinking about the state of politics and community in Memphis, you having served under so many uh, mm -hmm. uh, leaders in Memphis. And I want to try to see if you can draw us into a vision that would avoid any of the same pitfalls that we've experienced over the past several decades. What do you think has been our primary challenge? Because we've had black leadership, but we still, as has been echoed several times over, 50 years later are dealing with the same things that we had when we didn't have access to these leadership positions. So what do you think we could do? Unfortunately, um, in the last 50 years, Memphis has suffered uh, with a core group of leaders with an economic justice plan to hold elected officials accountable to. Mm -hmm. And when you don't hold them accountable to X, Y, and Z, they do A, B, and C. And, <laughs> and it's, and I, I'm, and I want to say this too, we have got to change, help our citizens learn the value of supporting candidates, yes. quality candidates. Mm -hmm. See, it's a little of them and it's a little of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when they get money from, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come on. <laughs> when Tell they get all. money from other parties with special interests, right. mm -hmm. yeah. right. your interest becomes not a non factor but less priority. Right. And that's why. It was wonderful when I was running. We had strong institutions like Aspen, Dr. Quirk, James Smith, uh, who would speak truth to power, who would hold you accountable, who would um, help you do what you need to do to run a good campaign and be well financed uh, so you um, know who. You work for the people of the city of Memphis, and you really shouldn't have to get that. But some people need, some people need a little nudge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we worked on some of these things regarding pallets when I was on the city council, and it was proud. I was proud of the work and the changes we made in the pallet program. And then with one change of officials and a stroke of a pen, just like we see today on the national level, mm -hmm. it all changed. It all changed. Ms. Scott Mitchell, thank you so much for your, thank you. for your comments. Um, you have been a, an advocate for change here. Uh, you've been a model for, for, for me and so many others. I, I, I guess when it comes right down to it, it it's, it's something that King showed us 50 years ago that we can't simultaneously coddle and confront corporate power. Mm -hmm. That's right. You simply can't do both of those things at the same time. Mm -hmm. Right? We That's can't exactly. we can't advocate for a living wage, but then give away all of our public funds to corporations and private interests and sometimes public interests that have no interest whatsoever <coughs> in providing those wages that we all say that we need. Right? And so I I, I share your your frustration um, in twenty eighteen where we still um, have not resolved, have not resolved this, this problem, right? This simultaneous effort to confront, uh, well, a lack of effort, actually, to confront, um, but more of an effort to coddle uh, a, a corporate, corporate, uh, corporate power. You also mentioned, and I wanted, to, I wanted you to maybe reflect a little bit on your observations about the, the number, the vast number of, of, of nonprofit organizations. Um, allegedly working on, um, you know, working on issues of, of poverty. Would you, would you, it, it seems to me, and you know, and I'll defer to your, your, your wisdom here, I've only, I'm not a Memphian yet, I've only been there for 13 years. It's going to be another like 30 years before people consider me a Memphian. So, you know, I, know, I know how this works. You know, I, I know how this works. I give you your card. <laughs> it seems to me that we are, we are really good about the business of the accommodation of poverty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
as opposed to the business of actually confronting poverty. Right. Mm -hmm. It seems to me right. that we have an infrastructure here that is dedicated to, that has, that has given over to the reality of slave wages in Memphis. Mm -hmm. It's given over to the reality of the, the non-existence of a living wage. Right? We're not going to fight for you to be able to feed your family. We're not going to fight for you to be able to get on a bus and be to work in under three hours. We're not going to fight for any of that stuff. What we're going to do is we're going to help you figure out how to live with the slave wages that you get from one of the many local companies here in town that's not paying you any money. Right? We're not going to confront the people who aren't paying the money. We're going to help you accommodate to the reality of poverty that we actually don't want to fight that we actually don't have any interest in fighting, right? So that's, that's, so that's, I mean, what do you, what do you think about that? What, what would your assessment be of, of the nonprofit terrain here that is, uh, again, my words, allegedly dedicated to, uh, to, to, to dealing with and grappling with the reality of poverty in Memphis? It relieves their guilt. Mm -hmm. uh, Missionary I was, endeavor. Yeah, yeah. I, I was, uh, I was asked this, this Thanksgiving to give money for baskets, food baskets, and I said, no, I'm not doing that right now. I'm not doing that. I've done that 30 years, 40 years. I'm not doing that anymore. What I am going to do, though, for every food service worker in these fast food places who are struggling to make it, I said, why don't we just one Thanksgiving season decide we're going to all tip them to let their managers know we want fifteen dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put my money where my mouth, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna start tipping food service workers. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, just at McDonald's, at Burger King, mm -hmm. and all of them. Mm -hmm. I said, but I'm not. They want to feed their own families. They don't want your basket. Right. They they want to buy their own children mm -hmm. items from the store to say, I I work for this and I got this for you. They don't want your hand handout. Mm -hmm. How do you think that makes them feel when somebody has to come in, come into the house with a basket and and a bicycle to say, we gave your son this. Yeah, you could. Right. Oh. Mm. <laughs> we destroy a family's pride. That's a sense of pride. That's right. We do. Yeah. <laughs> we got to find another way to make our <coughs> cases known. They deserve $15 an hour. Yeah. That's right. They deserve to be able to be at home with their children. They deserve to be able to uh, take them for medical appointments and do the things any other parent would be able to do for their children. They deserve that. They work hard, sometimes two jobs to my one. Sorry. Sister Mitchell, <laughs> I first of all want to, my name is Joanne Watson from Detroit. I want to applaud your message. Oh, okay. if you spoke, you spoke eloquently and with passion and with a sense of no selling out the interests of the people, our people. I, I want folks to know that what you have described with respect to Memphis could have been transposed on New York or Detroit or Chicago. Come on, somebody. I served on the city council in Detroit for 10 years. I sponsored a living wage ordinance and an anti-privatization ordinance. The privatization ordinance had been voted by the citizens seven years before I was elected in the law department because they were afraid of the corporate powers in Detroit. They did nothing Miami. to implement an ordinance that they said should be law. The citizens said, we don't want private contracts to take the place of people working. And they did nothing. After I passed it, and of course I fought and got it passed, living wage, privatization ordinance, then of course the press starts saying, oh, divisive, <laughs> anti-labor, uh, anti Chamber of Commerce. That's what they do. That's what they do. And then they set out to take over the whole city. The bankruptcy was never approved by the mayor and city council. It was approved by the same governor who poisoned Flint. Yeah. So the, the issues, anti-labor is anti-black. Anti-labor is anti-poor. Anti-labor is anti-people. It's anti-Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. So you put your hand on it today, and I thank you. Thank you. Right. One, one more commissioner. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. 
Just a wonderful presentation. Just thank you so much for being thank here. You. That's my first point. But I am fascinated by Dr. Lauterbach's article that was given to all the commissioners to read about the history of Memphis mm -hmm. and this whole uh, unfortunate situation between the Crump family and the church families. Mm -hmm. And noticing what happened there when it spoke about in terms of Memphis burning and what that burning was really about. And how it basically derailed any possibility of real African American empowerment around its own economic vision for its community. It was a systematic assault that derailed that vision. And so when, when we talk about where we are now with public policy, my question is, what can we learn from that period? Number one, what happened there? What are the learnings there that can help inform how we might redress some of these things going forward? That's one point. But the second point is going back to this question of black leadership. And of course, we, we've seen this all over the country where black leadership has inherited this DNA of derailments although they have been brought to power, but it's so much in the DNA of the policies, the culture, the lions within those communities that they're hard to deconstruct. What say you about what recommendations we can go forward with around deconstructing that DNA, pulling it apart, and looking at the learnings that may come out of these kinds of histories of derailment? Oh. I, I want to give some kudos. I don't know. Um, one thing is we need to look at our traditional institution, African-American institution, and look at their strength. And identify, and just be honest with yourself, be honest with the community of what they need. And I'm glad that Memphis has done that in the area of NAACP. I talked to some of you about that, Dr. Johnson, that we needed to, to revive the NAACP. And I'm so glad that that's, that's happening. Um, and then, also, and, and, and also, our communities really need to have its own agenda. That's right. We need to have our own agenda. That's and, it. And we need to have our own jobs comes. We need to plot our own strategy. We need to, our own core principles of what we believe in. That's and it. say it as a group. Mm -hmm. You can't, you, and then when you say it as a group, you can't, your elected officials will have to fall in line. That's right. Mm -hmm. They have to fall in line. It's a shame that Memphis has a majority of African American officials. And I have to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Now right. you just think about it. That's right. <laughs> uh, Go ahead. I shouldn't have to talk about this. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. better say it. This should not even be an issue for us. Mm -hmm. But we, we lost along the way. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at our traditional institutions that brought us thus far. Right. Strengthen them mm -hmm. so they can bring us the rest of the way. Yeah. All right. Now. Because we, we thought we didn't need that anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we got complacent, mm -hmm. and we do. Thank you. We this conversation has become quite lively, but we we must move on. Thank you, thank you, thank thank you Council and thank you for your merits. We'd like to welcome. Ms. Wendy Thomas, um, and she will give us her testimony. <coughs> Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Wendy C. Thomas, and I'm the editor and publisher of MLK 50 Justice Through Journalism. It's a year-long nonprofit uh, reporting project timed to the 50th anniversary of Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King's death. I've been planning this project since 2008, when I coordinated the Commercial Appeals coverage of the 40th anniversary of King's assassination. And the goal of this project is to force Memphis to reconcile the reality with King's dream, and not the, King, the dream of brotherhood that we often hear about, but the dream of economic justice. And in the spirit of Dr. King, MLK 50 is deliberately disruptive. After all, it was King who said, we are dealing with issues that cannot be solved without the nation spending billions of dollars and undergoing a radical redistribution of economic power. 50 years after King was killed, Memphis is the poorest large metro area in the country. In the city of Memphis, more than 52% of black children live below the poverty line. 
According to data collected by the Memphis Business Journal, in 2005, the revenues of a Memphis cotton warehouse founded 22 years after slavery ended, those revenues were five times higher than the revenues of the city's best performing black owned businesses. The wealth generated centuries ago using the exploited labor of formerly enslaved people in which is people who live today. And at the same time, in a city that's 63% black, black businesses earned less than 1% of revenue citywide, according to the latest federal data. That persistent economic inequality doesn't sit right with me. And I'm guessing that it doesn't sit right with you. Our city county economic development agency gives tax abatements to wealthy developers to build really nice apartments. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is these apartments rent for far more for far over $1,000 a month, and that's more than most residents can afford to pay, especially those who work in service industries. And the median annual back, uh, household income for black Memphians is just over $31,000, and for white Memphians, it's over $56,000. Now that racial income gap doesn't sit right with me, and I'm guessing it doesn't sit right with you either. The city of Memphis has a branding campaign to mark the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's death. And on light poles all around downtown hang these signs that read, where do we go from here? And of course, that was the title of Dr. King's last book. Right beneath one of those signs last month on a bench right outside City Hall, a woman froze to death. That strikes me as a preventable tragedy and a betrayal of King's dream, and I hope it strikes you the same way. These are inconvenient truths, but they are truths nonetheless. And it was the crusading anti-lynching Ida B. Wells who said, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. And that's what MLK 50 Justice Through Journalism tries to do. With a small team of freelance contributors, all of whom, I'm proud to say, are paid well more than $15 an hour. We examine structural, systemic, racist, and classist public policies and private sector practices, and we imagine a city that actually honors Dr. King's dream. Now, we are all familiar with this King quote, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. But we're not familiar with this other quote from King. The policy makers of the white society have caused the darkness. They create discrimination, they structured slums, and they perpetuate unemployment, ignorance, and poverty. And for our collective ignorance about the radical King, I hold the media responsible. And I've been part of the media for the last 25 years, including 11 years as the first black woman to write commentary full time for Memphis's daily newspaper. And these stories about how the privileged few profit from the exploited labor of many, of how systems keep poor people poor, these are stories that local media outlets don't often tell. Did you know that there are five states in the nation that don't have a state minimum wage? so it defaults to the federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. Mm -hmm. Tennessee is one of those states, and all five of those states are former slaveholding states. Mm -hmm. Tennessee has the highest share of minimum wage workers in the country. And a few years ago, the state legislature banned cities and counties from passing their own living wage ordinances. How can journalists connect these dots? and show that the high poverty rate among black Memphians is in large part because of public policies that are designed to keep poor people poor. That's right. mm -hmm. Local journalists often don't tell these stories and we don't connect these dots because to do so is to challenge the status quo. We would be asking tough questions of people unaccustomed to being questioned. But because we ask the wrong questions, we celebrate the wrong things. For example, on King Day just this year, mm -hmm. we oohed and odd over the NBA's warm-up jerseys that had MLK quote on it, 
while walking right past the concession workers and the ushers who make less than $10 an hour. Uh, during a fellowship I had two years ago at Harvard, I took a class with sociologist Matt Desmond, and he's the author of Evicted. And he posed this question to the class. What if poverty isn't an accident, but it's a robbery? I think it is a robbery. The thieves have names, and the names can be known. And I believe it is the job of responsible journalists to name names, no matter how much it might upset the Chamber of Commerce, or advertisers, or the status quo. Because when the media creates and maintains a narrative that supports the status quo, they perpetuate and justify public policy that is destructive for people of color. That's right. And I'll end with this. It's a challenge to myself and to all my fellow journalists who are, work, who are working harder than ever with even fewer resources than ever. Ask better questions. Ask how does this policy or practice affect the least of these? Ask who profits from this and who will be made poor? Ask, are we, always, are we doing what's always been done? Ask if we could remake the news so that it amplifies the voices of the most marginalized, of people of color, of people of different abilities, and members of the LGBT community. I want us to ask better questions so we don't celebrate the wrong things. Thank you. Just, just to comment and perhaps try and tie your presentation with the last one. We're discussing this as if this is a new phenomenon. Right. Uh, this is not new. That's right. Um, right. Yeah. And there are past policies and programs that have really addressed mm -hmm. this issue. I want to raise the fact that in the 30s, late, early 30s, you know, Roosevelt met the same situation, uh -huh. but it was a global problem, mm -hmm. uh, and he at least approached it by giving workers the right to organize and bargain collectively, National Labor Relations Act. Mm -hmm. uh, and it set the, set the nation on a, on, a, on, a, on a positive course. The, the problem we're dealing with is that the powerful people are taking advantage of that act and making it almost a racial weapon. That's right, yeah. Uh, and the work, workers as a whole can't find their way out of it. I mean, uh, you know, black and minority workers really suffer just like any other workers when there's bad policy. Uh, but, 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 but white workers can be convinced that if they starve at a slower rate, they are better off. I mean, <laughs> the logic escapes me, but... If, if all workers had the right to organize and the right to bargain with their employers, be they private sector, public sector, That's right. you, you would generate a, a situation where there are better wages uh, and communities, not just the worker, but communities prosper as a result of higher wages, higher community and regional uh, uh, economic policies. Uh, from a... a, 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 a reporter's perspective, and I'm not sure how you promote the interests of working people and their right to have representation or to participate in, in the process uh, to argue for better wages, better wages. Roosevelt gave us the National Labor Relations Act. There has been an attack on that act ever yep. since it was That's created. Exactly right. Uh, right up to and including the current Supreme Court issue we're dealing with. And, and how do we get the, the, the commentators uh, to focus on this issue? How do they do what you're doing and, and, and name those who are the opposers of economic progress? Right, so I think that that's um, difficult to do uh, in part because uh, the people that profit from things staying the way they are and have been for decades 
um, have a lot of influence and they're more likely to be consumers of the advertisers than our um, low wage people. And so I think that's an uphill um, challenge. I do think that part of what we can do is um, create our own media organizations and support those that, that exist. Um, I don't know how many of us have a subscription to the black newspaper in our town, but that's one way we can make sure there's a space for those voices to be told. Um, our brother, uh, Roland Martin, I'm not sure if he's still back in the back of the room. <laughs> uh, supporting the work that he's doing and, and other people, Angela Rye just started a new a TV show on BET. So I think we can amplify our own and not um, wait on majority mainstream media still led by white men to do something different than they've done their entire careers. How can we amplify your work? Um, you can go to mlk50.com and read and share our work. Um, I posted something just this morning about the two sanitation workers who were killed today, um, 50 years ago, in, um, in the back of a malfunctioning um, garbage truck and uh, why that death was absolutely preventable. Um, it, their deaths were due to um, a penny-pinching mayor at the time um, and a racist city policy. And so I encourage you to go to mlk50.com um, and read that. We are a nonprofit project, so we always appreciate um, your donations. And we're committed to keeping our content free um, and unbeholden to, um, unbeholden to uh, advertisers. Oh, go ahead. You can go. One of the things that um, I look at is the political implications in a lot of these issues, mm -hmm. where um, the politicians are buying for the people who give them money, mm -hmm. and they help to keep these things in place. There is an organization that goes from state to state and write legislation and just give it to the legislators mm -hmm. and they pass it that works against the working people yeah. and people of color and poor people. How can we fight back against that? I know we can go out and vote and elect um, new politicians, mm -hmm. but in the state that we're in now, what can we do to fight back against that? Um, so again, I think that's a challenge because this side is much well uh, that side is better funded than is um, our side often. So I think um, civil disobedience, massive civil disobedience of the kind that um, King did, of the kind that the Fight for 15 movement plans on February 12th of this year, which was the date um, 50 years ago that the sanitation workers strike um, had, I think, Using social media um, is, you know, it's a democratizing platform. You know, anybody has access to it, and it's free. And I think people can be mobilized um, that way as well. So I think we have to take advantage of the technology and the tools we have today to try to get the word out and to make it very clear um, how things happening in Nashville, those policies being passed out there, trickle down to what we see in Memphis. Hi, Wendy. Oh. Sorry, Pastor Andre, I'm <laughs> Ladies first. Yes, <laughs> ma'am. So we are a truth-telling commission, and there's um, something that you stated that I wanted to point out, because in your charge for the media to ask better questions, um, you said that black businesses earn less than 1% of tax revenue. Is, are those the mm -hmm. business receipts business citywide? Receipts so if citywide. you add up the money that all businesses earned in Memphis, black businesses got less than 1%, and that's down from the prior um, federal report. And, and we're talking about Memphis, right? Yes. Okay. And so when our current government, our city government, and even our county government uh, report statistics, Oftentimes, they're lauded as an improvement um, with mm -hmm. the current increase of minority businesses that receive uh, contracts from our city and our county government. Um, and there's been a lot of public relations pushed by the city and the county to show an increase in these um, in, in these numbers. And it's usually coupled under minority and women. You've done a lot of work to push the city to be honest and to tell the truth in how those numbers are reported. Can you talk to us about how they report the numbers and why they're misleading? Absolutely. Um, so 
local governments um, have to do disparity studies before they implement any kind of measure to, to correct the disparities um, in the contracts they award to different businesses. Um, city and county government, um, oh, they award hundreds of um, millions of dollars in contracts every year. And this is taxpayer dollars that's going to fund these contracts. So what the city and the county will report is the amount that they spend with minority and women-owned businesses. And women-owned business, businesses in this, in this case are white women-owned businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and so when they do that, when they put all, those, all that data together, um, what they don't do, what it does is it masks what's going to black-owned businesses specifically. Right. Um, there have been instances where I've gone and looked at some of the um, companies that have received tax breaks, how much they're spending with minority-owned businesses, and a disproportionate amount goes to Asian-owned businesses, and the Asians make up 1.6% of Memphis's uh, population, and then um, Hispanic-owned businesses, which make up about 6% of the population, and then a very little amount goes to um, black-owned businesses. So when you don't disaggregate that data and break it down, um, you're being fooled, right? So you may, the, the growth may be from 13% to 21%. So it means all those groups are still getting crumbs, that businesses owned by white men are still getting far more share of these contracts um, than their share of the population would suggest. Um, so again, that goes to the asking better questions, right? So instead right. of saying, right. what are your um, minority and women-owned business numbers, um, what are your black-owned business numbers? Um, and if they don't report that, they're, hi they're hiding something, right. Yeah. right? They're not being forthcoming, and they're not answering the questions that they know that citizens are going to have. And I'm so glad that I did uh, allow uh, Miss Tammy down there to go, because this is a perfect segue type of question, because uh, in the role of media, quantitative data matters. Yeah. Qualitatively, though, uh, can you speak to the role of media to critique the ideologies, and this is where I'm really dealing with, um, that produce stifling policies to begin with? So, for instance, uh, I think um, Chuck here did an excellent job at laying out the, uh, the, uh, the groundwork about, you know, charity versus justice, right? So. But there are policies and rhetoric in place that helps shape those policies and get people to believe that this is the best thing that we can possibly do at this particular time. So uh, um, would you speak a little bit about the media's role on critiquing the ideologies of bootstrap uh, mentality or uh, uh, if you work hard, you can you know, you know, make it and all of that good stuff that goes on. <laughs> so, um, you're right, the media does play a role in perpetuating these narratives that are not rooted in, in fact. Um, there's research out of Harvard, the Equality of Opportunity Report, that shows that in, in Memphis uh, particularly, or maybe Shelby County, um, the chances of a child who's born into the bottom quintile of household income has a 4% chance of going to the top quintile of household income as an adult. So when we tell kids to work hard and they can achieve anything, we are lying. That is just not, the evidence does not support that, right? Um, and so I'll give you one example. A few years ago in Memphis, there was a young um, black teen who got on a bus and went to the White Kroger, that was uh, the white grocery store, um, and offered to carry a, man's, a white man's groceries to the car in exchange for a box of donuts. And so this white man was so overcome with empathy for this child that he drove him home, saw that he lived in dilapidated conditions, and started a GoFundMe um, account uh, to help this young man. It raised, I don't know, maybe over $100,000, and this was painted as um, a success story. And it's not. Right. To me, it's a right. failure mm -hmm. um, that this teen had, that there is a white Kroger, right? Yep. That this teen yeah, felt that the best way for him to get help yep. was to travel there on the, on the bus, right. um, that his grandmother wasn't making enough in Social Security to be able to pay those bills. Um, that's, to me, there's several fail failures along the way. And I'll share this, this King quote. He said, true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. Mm -hmm. It comes to see oh, that an man. edifice which produces beggars yep. needs for structure. That's right. right. And so I think 
That is an example of one way that the media perpetuates that bootstraps um, mentality. And there's one other I want to mention that I didn't talk about in my speech, and that's um, criminal justice policy. Yes. Um, the evening news is often just an ad for the NRA. That's right. That's right. That's right. Nothing but crime report after crime report after crime report. And it's informed only by what the police say. Right. So never another aside. Um, criminal justice reporting, reporting on crime is really cheap news to create, yep. right? That's you right. just go stand at a scene, you take the police press release, you recite it, and you're done, right? And so um, I think this represents a disinvestment of media organizations to go a step further um, in their coverage. Um, it makes, uh, there's been studies that have shown that the more crime news there is in the community, the more afraid residents are of yeah. black people. I mean, there's yeah. direct ties, and the more likely they are to support very punitive public policy. So we have the quantitative data to support this, but we're not doing anything different. Now there are, in most you know, urban cities, uh, there is one or two black anchors on, on TV. Um, they're often a black news director. And so are we holding these people accountable? No. Um, are we saying we're going to, as King would have done, boycott these businesses? Um, and I'm not necessarily calling for a boycott, but those are measures that have worked in the past to force the power structure to do something different. And so maybe we need to return, do what, do what we know works. I, I want to quickly follow up on a point that you made about um, Memphis and the Inequality Project. It, isn't the it is not the case that in every city it's as bad as in Memphis. A highlight of that report is that policy matters. Right. So it, it is important for people in Memphis to understand that a child born in a different city in the same economic situation enjoys more mobility so that people understand it's not just that it's a, a lie, it's a lie in Memphis. Yes. Um, but I wanted to ask, tied to a point we have had before, the way the media covers demands that people work to get food assistance, demand that people work to get health insurance uh, provided for them. And yet, as we pointed out before, but I will give you a tax cut with a blank check. And the media don't seem to juxtapose why do we demand that some poor woman who's trying to feed her family, must accept any work at any wage for us to help them. And we're talking pennies versus I have to give you hundreds of thousands of dollars in tax relief and it's a blank check. I don't care what you do with it. Mm -hmm. Here's your blank check. And I put nothing on you in terms of, well, do something with this money. It's a blank check. The balance between the pennies to the poor versus the hundreds of thousands to the rich, a blank check, a laundry list of what you must do. But I never see the press push when they report on these kind of policy demands, uh, how is it that we accept these blank checks? Um, so I think there's two things on that. Um, one is um, the concept of uh, the undeserving poor, right? So that you're poor because of the bad choices you have made in life. Um, and so if that's uh, the case and that's the narrative, then it makes sense that you would have to atone for the bad choices you've made by accepting these low wages. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the converse is true, right? That if you're wealthy because you've made good choices and you should be rewarded with those, uh, for those good choices with tax abatements, tax breaks. Um, one quick example on that. Um, Bob Lowe, who is the nephew of Mayor Henry Lowe, who was the Mayor when King was, was here and was killed, um, just got $6 million in tax breaks to build a luxury hotel. That hotel project was gonna create 65 jobs. And so in the media narrative, that was the good thing, right? 65 jobs will be created by this project. 
Well, 45 of those jobs will pay less than $20,000 a year. And so the idea that we would give, we, we are subsidizing yeah. our own exactly. economic discrimination, right? Because this is, tax abatement means money that's not going into the school coffers. It isn't going to repair roads. Um, mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. just, it's inexplicable. It's inexplicable. Again, we thank you, Wendy, mm -hmm. for your brilliance, <laughs> for your presentation. And we must move on. And for the sacrifices that you have made. Yes. Absolutely. And I've for your courage. To know yeah. that yeah. you've taken a hit yeah. in this city yep. by speaking the truth. Mm. That's right. You've taken a hit. Mm. And we thank you. That needs to be put into the record. <laughs> that you've been targeted for speaking truth to power in the yes. city of Memphis. <laughs> that needs to be recognized. So thank yes. you for doing that. Yes. Targeted and threat. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now we'd like to welcome Mr. Kedron Franklin, who is a member of the Coalition of Concerned Citizens. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to say thank you guys. It's an honor to be here. Praise God. Appreciate it. Most definitely. Most definitely. Um, the two presentations that went before me was great and wonderful. But I just want to get into my testimony on I guess I am Keevan Franklin, uh, born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, South Parkway area, Cal Street, South Memphis. Uh, and I am the product of the struggle. I am the product of the failures that has been bellowing the city for years, even before I was born, born in 86. Um, mom, you know, we moved to the southwest side of town uh, around the 90s to the projects where I was uh, introduced to older gentlemen, twice my age. And, and so we became to come into situations like street gangs, or what, what people call street gangs, but they're street organizations. Right. I'm nine years old running with 19 year olds and 20 year olds. <coughs> that, that, that had the, the wherewithal to know not to put me into the same situations that they was in. So although I come up in a street organization, I also had people that scolded me to make sure I kind of led the right path because they went through it, and they didn't want to see a, a, a person that looked like them go through the same situation. And we struggled. That's the, you look at half of Memphis, over 42% of the youth struggle. They're living in poverty right now. And so there's all type of outlets that we want to utilize to try to you know, make a better situation at home. And a lot of it, we fall into things like uh, selling petty weed to feed your family, People start robbing to put pampers on their children, to put food on the table. And it goes into senseless things like killing. But instead of the city actually acknowledging that we have a, a poor city, uh, underserved, undereducated, uh, and uneducated city, a structural systemic issue, then we would never get to the root of, of the problem, which is one of them, the economic disparities in the economic injustice. Um, so fast forward, um, I kind of got into wanting to do outreach, you know, community outreach. Uh, being a part of a, of a street organization, I, I got deep into the literature and it taught me a lot about <laughs> wanting to help us, you know, uh, do better for us. It wasn't the, you know, where a lot of people see how they advertise our game. I want to do a shoot. No, there, there's a real fellowship, a real lively a love that comes from street organizations. That's equivalent to if you go and join a fraternity or a sorority. It's, and, and a lot of people don't understand that a lot of a lot of things we went through as children, and probably still go through today, come from traumas. And so we try to find an outlet. Some of those outlets are not being uh, uh, civil to society. Who actually created what? civil or you know being civilized is and so want to do outreach work figuring i have to do better you know i've caused so much trauma or pain that i wanted to correct those by reaching out you know spending my time with more youth uh, being some type of mentor uh, just as i had as i was growing up it kind of led me into doing uh, i started working with uh, Mayor Warden's 901 Block Squad, which was a Memphis gun down initiative to kind of help deter gang violence and uh, 
senseless shootings. And, you know, I, I like to research and really learn more, no matter what, what field or capacity I'm in, and found out that the same at registrar that we was using, utilizing to keep track of the youth, like the, the, the system was actually tied into this. So the police could actually monitor the children as they're coming out of juvenile and trying to get readapted into society. They're watching them and two, three years later, they're back in jail. This time it's 201 and they're going out to the penitentiary. So I really got to pay attention to the school to prison pipeline situation that was deeply embedded in, in our system here in Memphis, Tennessee and how they try to uh, shadow it by just saying, there's a gang problem. Right. Uh, and so that turned me into, I guess, what a lot of people see today as uh, an angry black man, <laughs> as, they show on, as they show on the news or, or any other article they try to show me at, at that passionate state where I'm, I'm kind of barking back at the status quo. Uh, and, I, and I take that respectfully because one thing we realize that regardless if we're so-called black or so-called white, the biggest issue is that we're poor in the city and this is, this is what perpetuates a lot of what else happens. A lot of it is inter, interchangeable and, and, and intermingled. So they got my wheels to turn. Okay, what else is going on? What else are they lying to us about? Um, and just speaking up, speaking truth to power. Later, in 2016, uh, something significant happened where there was just a lot of tension, a lot of pressure in the air. Just, uh, you know, people was actually fed up. And uh, we ended up marching to the Hernando de Soto Bridge and shut it down for closely six hours. Uh, and, and out of that, we realized <laughs> that the powers that be wanted to give us everything we wanted just so they could get us off their bridge. And so it started <laughs> us to thinking, what's actually with this, you know? And if you relate it back to even what King was fighting for when he was here, it's the economics. They was worried about the money that they was losing while that bridge was shut down, because it's a big corridor for people to pretty much go from here to Mexico. <laughs> so, so they wanted to be able to free that up, a lot of commerce. And, and we was looking into the, we called it, it was roughly $100 million we cost them that night just by shutting it down. And so it started our brains to ticking like, hey, this is what they care about when it comes down to it, the commerce. This, this all that, that they react to is if you can show them a force of power. And so with that, uh, civil disobedience has been one of the biggest things that the Coalition of Concerned Citizens has inoculated in the city as the last two, three years. Uh, most definitely since 2016, C3 formed out of their bridge shut down, recognizing that uh, we have to break a lot of the barriers. I was fortunate enough to have elders who, who spilled a lot of uh, knowledge into me and, and kind of woke me up to realize that we have to not just pay attention to the color of the skin, but the people who's in the same predicaments and the same conditions as us. And so it started me to moving and organizing around my Latinx community, the Palestinians, who's also being oppressed just as much as we are right now. And, and, and so on and so forth, even the so-called whites that's living in, in poverty. And so that started out brains to turn like who's controlling the funds here? <laughs> the Chamber of Commerce in Memphis tomorrow. So we ended up doing an informational picket on the Chamber of Commerce in Memphis tomorrow because looking into them, uh, they still had highlighted on their website they was courting businesses here on low wages. Yes. And we, it smacked us in the face, like, what the, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Long story short, uh, we did an informational picket, highlighting this was going on. They didn't want that, you know, going out so far. They, within 30 minutes, uh, Shea Flynn and Phil Trinero was down on the ground trying to see what's going on. Yeah. And one of the things we brought up was temp agencies. Temp right. agencies pimp us to death. Right. <laughs> temp right. agencies right. in a right to work state right. at that. Right. So it's a double whammy. Yeah. You know? and, and so reading into how the temp agencies regulated, we found out that contractually they were supposed to pay $12 an hour and they wasn't. That's right. you know? mm -hmm. At the same time, Electrolux was working on unionizing, uh, IBW was working on unionizing Electrolux and, and 
Come to find out, because I'm also a labor organizer for Fight for 15. You better say that. <laughs> um, we kind of bump, bump heads and just figured out how to, you know, how can we help? Since we're in, started going into meetings with the Chamber of Commerce, they're controlling a lot of the temp agencies that's hiring people for Electro Lux. IBW has the data, so we started figuring out we, we have to be intersectional mm -hmm. because we, we have information in all these silos mm -hmm. and, and, and it's hurting us the most. So yeah. we decided, hey, you know, come on into these meetings so that the Chamber of Commerce can hear it firsthand with the data that you guys have. Mm -hmm. And so they started working behind doors on making sure uh, a lot of these things were actually being held accountable on because no one was holding them accountable. There was no apparatus to make sure they're held accountable just with the temp agencies. Uh, another thing, the minority contract piece. Just as Sister Wendy Thomas said, it's, it's a front company. You have a, a system where so-called black people would cut their check, uh, get 10% of it and take it back to the city for them to take it to somebody like a Chris Woods who's building up all the construction <laughs> in the sites around the city. It, it, they perpetuate the poverty by doing little small things like that. And it took a person of color, like me, myself, who's not afraid to actually challenge them, being that fearless, you know, uh, person that come through a struggle that, you know, being yelled at and followed by the police was my norm. <laughs> That's all y'all gonna do, you know? Oh, okay, so. <laughs> so I head, head, head on, I have to bust it open because there's, you know, more people like me who's been in that situation you know, get in the car and you're driving and police behind you, you get the sweat. And you know you haven't done anything wrong, mm -hmm. but it's just because of one, how they view people of color, how they paint us as terrorists or monsters right. or mm -hmm. this angry black man. And it's not at all you know, that. And so digging deeper, we started having issues of the police telling us, the police following, popping up at my house, um, until it started leading to situations where we actually had to file lawsuits. Mm -hmm. uh, one incident, Graceland, I don't know how, right. how it, it kind of got swept under the rug, but Graceland conspired with Memphis Police Department mm -hmm. August of last year, August 15th of mm -hmm. 2016, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. um, to keep so-called black people from walking on the public street that we usually could walk on any other day except for Elvis's birthday. Mm -hmm. And just like them, they had an issue with it. They pushed back, um, and that kind of spiraled into another situation where they was doing political intelligence, and out came a situation called the Blacklist, right. where a lot of political people that were speaking out, um, you know, the, uh, came, you know, was on the list where the police watching them. We couldn't enter city hall without an escort for no reasons. But it goes completely against a 1976 consent decree of the Kendrick Order where they can't do that. Mm -hmm. You can't. Just because I want to speak out, you, you can't trail me, you can't follow me. Um, and so things like that led to us doing some things like the die-in on the marriage yard because we felt dehumanized, we felt less than be because of certain things that they have been doing towards us. Um, and just highlight what's going on. And so civil disobedience, as I agree with my sister Wendy Thomas again, civil disobedience is one of the only things that will ever make them pay attention and, and one of the key steps into what the Coalition of Concerned Citizens do and do well. Uh, we also, in last, it was last year, Lowe Properties. We want to highlight because Bob Lowe, the Lowe family, has been around forever, causing trauma forever. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to highlight that. So what we wanted to do was do uh, street theater in such a different way. You know, sometimes protests, you know, out there screaming, people don't get it. So we figured let's do something different. Uh, all these so-called white people who will be on the street, they you know, they'll like this show. And so what we called it was the real obscenities, where we actually highlighted things in our cities. We did vignettes of obscenities in our city that they want to suppress and oppress. One being uh, the 12, 13,000 rape kits right. that, that they're hiding and don't want, don't want to put the capacity or, or put the money into making sure they can test them and, and move forward with that. Mm -hmm. 
The other was the homeless, homelessness problem, but we don't have a free shelter in the city at all. And, and the, the one or two mission halls that, that does, they don't have transitional homes for the LGBT uh, community, or mostly women that's pregnant. And then you have this situation where, uh, you know, people don't understand consent. And so for a woman and a child, or a young lady and a child to be in a place where you have a bunch of people who don't understand consent is very dangerous. And it's not, it's not secure. So I, I, I wouldn't want to be in a place like that myself if I had to worry about people keeping them hands to themselves. And so just highlight so many obscenities, um, the people got it. You know, I think we've never done a, a protest where the people, we didn't have people push back. Only one guy pushed back, and it's because he didn't believe in rape. <laughs> and there was a fight between this so-called white guy and another woman. Good, we got them to thinking. So, so um, yes, civil disobedience is, is one of our main uh, forces. And we maintain that what we call the hammer, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's the gavel. You want them to listen? We know how to make them listen. And, and the coalition is comprised of about 40 different organizations and businesses and unions that, that get this, you know? They get intersectionality. They understand that. That don't mean we all have to eat at the same table and, and, and go Yankee Doodle dance together, but there's a vision. And, and as long as we know the end goal is for us to, you know, free ourselves of oppression, I don't really care what route you take, you know, I'm supporting you, my brother or my sister. And so, not to hold you too long, that's my testimony. And I appreciate and honor you all's again. Yes, thank you so very much. Thank you. Um, my assumption in my upbringing was that gangs were bad. Your presentation tells me that there are some good things about gangs and there are some bad things about gangs. I'd like you to answer, tell me some of the good things about gangs and what I could do to help support that. And tell me some of the bad things about gangs and what I could do to help gangs begin to let the good things about themselves be more significant than the bad things about them. I hear you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, good things. For me, uh, there is literature. A lot of these street organizations, first let's change it from gangs to street organizations because that's a trigger word for the Fed to get more money. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so street organizations, street organizations what, what, what turned the tide for me is I, I, started, I started getting in, getting in contact with people who, was way, who I felt was way above my level, you know. Uh, but they, they accepted me. You know, anytime they come to the city, they make sure I'm there. And, and so they started showing me more literature about science, you know, about things that's around us in nature. And I'm like, wow, you know, it, it kind of, you know, burst the, 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 the pot open for me to see that there was, there was other things that was more knowledgeable to attain from street organizations. Just you look at the structure, you know, a street organization is structured just like a business is structured like city government. You know, most street organizations, they're structured the same way. You have some that's pretty much derived from some type of religion, you know, or, or some type of um, some type of religion. Most, you know, like some of them use crescent moons with a star, you know, following Islam. Uh, some use the six point star, the star of David. But but there's this negative connotation once it comes to uh, from taking it from the paper to being active on the streets. So what you have is a disconnect from the people who put the, the literature together to the people who's accepting it on the street. And, and the disconnect comes from the person who's sometimes handing those you know, situations down. They manipulate it. And so there's, there's one of the things we kind of found in Memphis now where you don't have like a vice lords or the GDs and the Bloods and the Crips, now you have Splinter gangs, you know, mm -hmm. offset street organizations. They come from out of those gangs, those street organizations, because they realize 
it's too much manipulation going on, you know, and I can do the same thing. Or, mm -hmm. you know, you know, the head of this organization is poor, you know, what I look like follow him and I can go and do this easy stuff and, and make more money. And so that's one of the bad things that I see with street organizations is the manipulation of what's actually been taught, what, you know, what was actually the founding principles of most of the street organizations. You can go and look at, at, at the CVLs in Chicago, like they had a so-called black Palestinian like community. Like that was one of the beautiful things you can see were, were actually trade uh, resources and, and helping each other. Uh, Palestine is an apartheid state, just like we are in Memphis when it comes down to it. We're actually, you know, really poor and far away from the resources. And so it leads us into a hopeless effect, but we wanna, we're gonna go do something. And, and, and if you're traumatized, then you're, you kind of lose options. You, you just think about, okay, I know this one way. Even though I think I may can do something, I may think I can do something positive here, but I know for sure I have this one way. So when you're hopeless, you have no options. They're kind of blinded, you know? And so one way I feel you can help a young brother that's a part of the street organization, listen. Hmm. A lot of us just want to be heard, you know? And it shows up a different way. It may show up because I'm sagging my pants and mm -hmm. I want to play my rap music live. But I want to be heard. I want to express myself. I don't know how to express myself. There's something you have to... We don't know how to express ourselves. We, we're emotionally illiterate. You know, I, I don't want to be honest that I'm sad that they feel like I'm a thug. I don't want to be honest with that because then I got to challenge myself. So just listen, please. Go ahead. I want to, I want to applaud your organizing. You are an organizer. Yes. And what you have described today is a textbook case of how to change uh, oppression mm -hmm. from, the, from the source of power. Frederick Douglass said power can see nothing without okay. demand. Yep. Never has and never will. We have to do just what you've done everywhere all the time. Because now folks think they're activists if they're on social media. No, you shut something down. <laughs> You, you stop the power, so-called power brokers from commerce. My horse. Hey, so you have shown it, and don't worry about gang labels, because back in the day, uh, Jesus and the 12 disciples might have been called a gang. Mm -hmm. But you, you are, absolutely, what, what Brother Lucy talked about in terms of uh, Roosevelt's uh, support of the National Labor Rate, people were in the street. Uh, Roosevelt, President Roosevelt didn't do that. And in, in, uh, in a silo, people were in the street. They were silent marches against what's right. been going on. Yes, it's important for us to get back to organizing, organize, organize. And you're doing it. Don't stop. Uh, keep 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 your, keep your eye on your troops around you. Because somebody in there is going to be paid by the COINTELPRO. Yes, ma'am. Somebody in there is going to be uh, trying to poison the, the goodness of the group and your plan. So watch and watch and watch and pray. Yes, ma'am. Uh, God bless you. Thank you. Powerful, powerful. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, y'all. I talk a lot. Uh, always. Brother Keegan, I like to second that. Watch your troops. Uh, we know how that goes. But I had two things I want to ask you. I'm just going to pick one. Um, because as always, I was moved by what you shared. But... You use a lot of language about trauma and emotional, um, especially what you said about uh, young black boys being emotionally illiterate. And as we try to get to a place where we're actually moving these numbers that we're seeing have moved very little in the last 50 years, I think that this language around trauma is going to arise more. Can you just share with us a little bit, Kijan, how you got to a place where your emotional literacy rose and you began to see what trauma looked like and how we care for it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of it really came with um, understanding, you know, understanding other people and being concerned, you know. Just like sometimes I can see someone walking down the street and, and something may, a judgment may come up in my head, you know. And they're acting like this or acting like that without really understanding why they're being their way. Uh, and for me, it, 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 it come about 
being around a community of people who opened my eyes up to that. Well, we're not afraid to hug a man, you know, because I, I, I know me, I know myself, you know, and I also know that there's been times where I went to look for friends that I haven't seen in a while and come to find out they died. And I wish I could have hugged, you know, and, and so just coming into myself, knowing who I am, I always kind of knew who I was and, and was knew where I wanted to go with just my life, not being another statistic, you know. And so, you know, just coming more to myself, and I guess it's coming with growth, you know, and so I, I make sure to kind of reiterate that a lot, even with the young brothers or sisters that come in contact in these different neighborhoods uh, that's impoverished, you know. I, I, I tell them, you know, they can say, hold the door for me, and I may tell them, hey, thank you. I honor you for that, because you didn't have to. It makes, me, it makes a person feel special for someone to not say, you know, or for someone to say, hey, I honor you, or I believe in you, and not just saying it, but actually, you know, doing something to uh, accommodate why, they, why you believe in them, or why you honor them, like actually uh, speaking to it. So that's pretty much where it, where it comes from, just being part of a, a, a community that actually has been working on that for the last 20, 25 years with just helping us deal with our traumas because we go through so much. And at, at young age, and a lot of people, we find a lot of those first traumas come from our household. That's right. So you find us want to leave the household to get away from the trauma. Right. And then we forget about some of the things. And then we forget that we forgot. And then something pop off and we go from zero to 100. And they be like, dang, it can't be that crazy. No, it just pop. You know, sometimes do some things that there that, and, and we have to get out of our head. But those are lessons that we learn as we grow and develop, you know. That sometimes one plus one only equals two just because you're here. If it doesn't align here with your heart and in your gut, then you're not you're not dealing with reality. And and with that, you have to be careful on how you how you even judge people or, or how you move and impact others. So that, that's kind of where it came from. Thank you. I have to say, um, so I'm a psychologist. I'm a <laughs> um, adolescent psychologist. So I'm excited to finally get to this point where we're talking about mental health, right? Because that's something yep. we don't talk about in the black community. Mm -hmm. We don't acknowledge, <laughs> and we even less acknowledge it in men, right? Mm -hmm. Something called the racial empathy gap where we think black people don't feel pain in the mm -hmm. same way physically, where doctors give less medication to black people when they need it, mm -hmm. also emotionally, and we're talking about that. We're talking about being, it being okay to hug somebody. And those are conversations that we don't talk about enough. And so I want to, I think, applaud you as the rest of my commissioners have been talking about, um, about having these conversations because we don't talk about it enough. And so asking you, what do we do to have more of these, to make it okay to have these conversations? <coughs> And how do we, I think the, one, of our biggest, um, one of the biggest fallacies we've been told is that we're all fighting different battles. And so you also talked about intersectionality and how we don't talk about our LGBTQ brothers and sisters. We don't talk about um, Latinx community. We, we're all separated to believe that we're fighting different battles when we're all fighting the same one. So how do we all get on the same page as the tall <laughs> order? <laughs> how do we all get on the same page, right? So that mm -hmm. so many other adolescent boys who are 16 and watching the news every day and seeing these negative images over and over again, and yet being told it's not okay to cry, it's not okay to feel sad. How do we have more of these conversations? <sighs> Uh, it's really hard to even have those type of conversations, especially when you don't even know that you've been traumatized. A lot of us don't know that we're in this state, you know, so yeah. so trying to go and tell someone, man, express yourself, how you feel? Man, I'll say, man, I feel good, you know, <laughs> and, you know and, and not really getting under the surface. So I think first it starts with um, trying to feed, create a, a safe container, you know, where there's no judgment and it won't leave outside of the container because we all messed up, <laughs> you know. Everyone in this room has has issues that that they're either working on or because it's it's continual work. Mm -hmm. And so 
also acknowledging that we ourselves, you know, even with speaking with the youth that I myself may have an issue, you know, or just, you know, telling them about certain, certain issues that I may be going through and that I'm still working on. But one of the ways that I judge we can start those conversations is just start them, you know, create, create you a nice circle, a container, whether it's five people um, or if it's 50 people, people who understand that, you know, what's going on in here is, us, is all about ourselves. No matter what you do today, tomorrow, what you say, how you impact others, it's all about you. You know, your projections on life, your perceptions on life, it's all about you and, and your view through life. And so, also, you know, enlighten people that, you know, saying things about others says a lot about yourself. And so, uh, those conversations are hard to start when people don't really understand just the basis of psychology or how how that works so um, I think first is just first putting together a container uh, and, and listening you know and then hopefully people can start asking the right questions or you can kind of lead people into well this kind of works for me I got like I said I, I go to the belly of the beast some of the neighborhoods that a lot of people are afraid to go to I go by myself I Travel. I like to travel. Just left Mexico this weekend, so I, I like to move around by myself. Uh, but at the same time, I go to some of these neighborhoods where, you know, you walk around with ankle braces on because they're fresh out of jail or juvenile. And I may walk up to one of my elders and hug them, you know, and not just no, you know, dab and hug, just hug. How you good? Peace, God. You know, I see someone that looks like me, I, you know, someone that represents me. And so I want to reciprocate the love that I see in this person because that's me, you know. And, and so, and, th and that's just how I operate. Uh, and, and it also shows others, you know, that, I, you know, this guy that looked like me, quite naturally, you can tell, I come from the struggle. Uh, and, and, and so they kind of break those barriers. So they're not afraid to even, you know, then start just not being so mean to others, you know being careful how they speak with others because they realize that a lot of it is what they say about someone, you know, one of the big things in Memphis is people love checking, you know. And you walk in the room, you got some new shoes on, somebody's like, you got some new shoes on, you fresh, ain't it? You know, <laughs> you cool, ain't like. And a lot of that says a lot about themselves. It's something they don't understand. I think the more we, we come enlightened with, what I say about you says a lot about myself or how I think about you or what I judge about you says a lot about myself. I think we'd be a little bit more or less concerned with how people operate and more concerned about their well-being, you know, because it's something driving their, their, their behavior. May I say that I appreciate so much what you said today. I really appreciate your testimony very much. Yes, and my I have just two questions. One is, how can, what role, what, what is a bigger role for the faith community to play in terms of the kinds of recommendations that you're providing for us here? Uh, and second of all, how do we look at the models of leadership that you've created within the space that you're leading to be replicated mm. in other places, and particularly replicated with the faith community if you feel there's a significant yes, role or even a small role yes, that faith can play relative to the advancement of the vision that you're seeking to achieve? Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, I was born and raised in the church. <laughs> and my family founded Galilee AME Church on, on Oakland. So I, this is something I've known my whole life, but it was something missing with being inside of the church. Mm -hmm. I realized that there was just something missing for me. I didn't want to go inside of a church anymore. I, I turned about 15, 16. I'm like, what am I going to church for? That? It doesn't fulfill me. I found that the pastor did a lot of shaming and condemning. And I don't want to be around that. Who does? So figuring out how to bring faith outside of the church where the people are right. and, and not getting so far away from the principles of religion or, you know, or the denominations, but taking it somewhere and not forcing it, forcing it on people. And, and that's something that, that works well with just <coughs> receiving information. Some people didn't come up in churches, so a lot of them don't want to just hear about God. Because they think about God, they think about this white man with blue eyes and right. wavy, right. you know, her, you know, Fabio. And they don't look <laughs> like that. <laughs> and this is just my interpretation on, on, on And so being able to just come out, and, and there's a lot of skills that the church 
have. There's a lot of there's a lot of diplomacy that can be used that's used within the church, right outside. You don't have to go far. Within a two block radius of each church, just go out, canvas and, and meet the people. You know, a, a weekly what we call power hours. One hour a week, a Saturday, you can spend forty dollars and feed two hundred people off hot dogs and hamburger patties. Like that that's that's a lot that go into someone. You can nourish them with food and then you can Drop the word in there. <laughs> you know, not so much, but just enough to where they like. You know what? I like that. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go back and check it out. You know, uh, but but that that's one way I feel like the faith community can really assist with not not trying to get more members, but just trying to help change the narrative. Because if you look at a lot of the same youth, their grandparents are in your church, or their mother is a part of the congregation, so they're gonna adhere to you. They just want you to kind of meet them on our level. You know, and, and then it's a you know give and go. They come some, you come some. Mm -hmm. Eventually, y'all meet at the front door, and they bring their whole crew in church. <laughs> you know, and, and so it works that way. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can you share one other point, and that is that uh, a big contribution that that you seem to be making is uh, on intersectionality with other groups. But I think that what many people reflect on among street organizations is, is and it's great that you get the intersectionality, but, but the pain of turning on ourselves, that we will, even though we know, <laughs> you are not the reason I am unemployed. Right. Mm -hmm. You don't have a business big enough to make the decisions to make that happen. Right. But I will shoot you anyway, out of the pain that I'm feeling, right. as if, Shooting you addresses the pain from that economic violence. Mm -hmm. and, and I love the way that you talk about trauma because it's important for us to understand as, as racial economic justice. There is such a thing as economic violence. Most definitely. Most definitely. It's, it's, it's us mimicking the oppressor. You know, it's like I've been oppressed so long that I, I want to oppress the next person who I can't oppress because I can't oppress them. I actually don't know who to oppress. <laughs> and so, crime and proximity. You know, I don't have gas to go out here and rob the rich white man, so I'm going to rob my brother right here, you know. But it's senseless if you think about it. And, and a lot of it is self-hate because I also look at myself and I don't like myself because I'm struggling. Man, I can't put food on the table or, you know, people look at me like a thug, so I'm going to look at someone and I'm, this is how I look at myself. So the things I do to you is really what I want to do to myself if I don't do it to myself, you know. And it, that's just how I judge it or look at it. That, a lot of senseless things. Now you have some some things people just, you know, it, it's even out of a mental health issue. They just it's just them, you know. But you have a, a vast number of people who who are uh, mentally uh, impaired in such a, and it's coming from different different hazards. Such as we have a lead issue here in the city mm -hmm. that they've been trying to cover for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And a study showed that any city or state that has lead, the crime is two to three times higher. But they don't want to speak about that. <laughs> you know, they don't want to get all the doctors and clinicians and physicians here to, to help with that issue because it's going to cost them more money. Instead of just saying, hey, feds, we need more money for gang injunctions. We need to shut down the Riverside Crips. <laughs> you know, like those are the type of things that that they only want because it's easier, you know, it's easier for them. And, and so we kind of replicate that with how we treat each other. It's easier for me to just go and, go and rob the dope man. What are you going to do, call the police? <laughs> so I stole this, and so this, you know, kind of proximity and crime of opportunity at the same time. Can I just add one thing for our record? I think um, I've been very thankful for everything you've said. I think that you are in the tradition of black, brilliant organizing, yep. uh, and I just want to lift that up. Mm -hmm. But one of the crimes I also think that we just need to acknowledge is that the way that we have defunded and devalued that kind of organizing. Yeah. And that, right. that we actually have to, as we think about our policy work, yep. that we actually have to have a radical, aggressive strategy to fund mm -hmm. the kind of organizing <laughs> and the kind of creativity that you're talking yeah. about. Right. And so I just want to acknowledge that, I and I bet it. if because you're in that tradition, I bet there's ways in which we could be even more creative about the things that are in the way for mm -hmm. you to do that kind of organizing. Mm -hmm. And how do we deal with the shame and the uh, fear 
that many of our communities have around the kind of radical, powerful organizing that you're yeah. lifting up? Two things. I appreciate that. And one of the, I guess, Brother Lucy left, but I kind of credit a lot of what he he's done in the past and, and to present with how I organize today. Mm. With for a lot of people that don't, I'm sure a lot of people here mm. do know. Most definitely, y'all on a panel like in the labor movement. Movement. He's a god <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> to labor movement, and so I kind of model that in the community. <laughs> Not just the necessities we need on our job, how do we take those necessities and get them in our community? And so one of the things we kind of uh, came up with was trying to revitalize what we call community unions, where we can pool our resources together to get what we want, and we don't have to go and beg them for USDA yes. grants or block grants. Yes. We can pool our resources together and say, hey, you know what? Mm -hmm. We got 10,000 people paying dues members, you know, and, and they can allocate us some, you know, funding or, or like I said, it allocates us the, the resources that we need. One of the things I didn't mention was we also created a, a, a community land trust. The only community land trust in the state of Tennessee is called C3 Land Cooperative. And one of the things we've been noticing with the food desert that's been popping up is, is we're lacking when it comes to basic resources. This city is 80% renters, so no one's really owning their home. So we're locked out of a lot of the necessities that we need when it comes to being able to have the land to grow our own produce, where we don't have to spend half of our money on trying to eat good or eat fresh, because you're gonna go and buy a dollar pack of noodles with six packs of ramen noodles in there, then you'll buy a dollar head of cabbage, you know, because it'll stretch more, and so you have to balance between stretching and eating fresh. And so that's something we've been working on, was creating a worker-owned cooperative where the people control it, it's a fix. You don't have to worry about a CEO making thirty thousand dollars an hour, you know, and, and the employees only making twenty thousand a year, and, and it's it's long lasting. Worker cooperatives are popping up, and those are lasting. You look at Jackson, Mississippi has one of the best worker cooperatives. That's right. Like there's things lasting that we can put in play yeah. between us. There was a point in time where well, we had twenty five percent of the wealth you know, generating between us, you know? And, and, and we can get back there to places like the Black Wall Street. Mm -hmm. But this time we can do it in such a way that they can't turn it down. Mm -hmm. We want to thank you. Yeah. In fact, we, we need to give you a standing ovation. Representative, Re 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 yeah. can yeah. I just shout yeah. you out, man? I, I am uh, thankful for you yeah. and your work. Yeah. I'm honored to work with yeah. you, march with you, stand with you, talk with you, and Thank you for leading us in yes. this city yes. Yes, and the work that you have been doing. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Keith. God is at work here. The last words to me from Mr. Lucy was that he wants to meet with that young man. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kedron. Um, so what a powerful morning we've had so far. Um, we're going to go ahead and move into our break very briefly from 11 to, I mean, I'm sorry, it's 11.30. So we're going to move into our break from 11.30 to 11.40. Um, Reverend Dr. Forrest does have to travel this afternoon, so we are going to welcome you as soon as the break comes back, as soon as the break ends. Um, we'll have testimony from Reverend Dr. Um, Forrest Harris. So... Um, and I welcome you to silence your phones during this break. I welcome you to move to the first three rows during the break. If you would like to, we would love for the room to be a, a little bit more fuller. Um, and then after we hear from two more testifiers, we will have lunch. So thank you so much. Oh, Chuck, this young bro. Yeah.